So now it's my distinct honor to introduce them. Please help me welcome our first panelist, the producer of Waiting for Superman, Ms. Leslie Chilcott. <laughs> Leslie collaborated with Davis on the documentary An Inconvenient Truth. Before that, she began her careers at MTV Networks, working on large multi-camera shows, including the creation of the very first MTV Movie Awards. After MTV, Leslie helped launch 10th Planet Productions, producing music specials and multi-camera events. And then Leslie moved on as an independent commercial producer, working with numerous distinguished directors and producing hundreds of commercials and PSAs over the last 15 years. In addition to her work as a documentary and commercial producer, in 2008, Leslie co-founded the nonprofit organization Unscrew America, which continues her dedication towards sustainability and environmental issues. Leslie is also a green correspondent and writes for several magazines. Thank you so much for joining us, Leslie. <laughs> Our next panelist is no stranger to the California Charter School movement and a longtime leader, our friend, Dr. Ref Rodriguez. <laughs> Dr. Ref Rodriguez is president and CEO of Partnership Partners for Developing Fu Futures. Partners is a social venture investment fund that primarily invests in high potential, early stage, minority-led charter schools and charter school networks that are addressing the needs of underserved students. Partners' mission is to recruit, identify, and support leaders of color in creating and growing new charter schools. Prior to joining Partners, Ref was co-founder and co-CEO of Partnerships to Uplift Communities, also known as Puck Schools, which is a charter management organization serving Northeast San Fernando Valley and downtown Los Angeles. Ref's original inspiration for starting a charter school was to what? offer high quality learning experiences to the primarily working class Latino communities in which he grew up. Thank you so much for participating, Ref. <laughs> Our final panelist is co-founder and CEO of Summit Public Schools, as well as a CCSA board member, Ms. Diane Tavner. Summit, Summit Public Schools, which was one of the five schools profiled in the film Waiting for Superman, is a nonprofit organization committed to stu preparing students for success at the college and career level. In 2003, Diane opened Summit Preparatory Charter High School in Redwood City. And prior to that, she spent over 10 years serving as a teacher, administrator, and leader in many traditional urban and suburban public schools throughout California. Thank you so much for joining us, Diane. Last but definitely not least, I have the honor of introducing our moderator for today, Washington Post education reporter, Mr. Jay Matthews. I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. And really, you are leading and driving what's often considered a very sensitive and debatable topic, but so need, in such need to be discussed. So Jay, please take it away. Thanks a lot, Steve. I I'm so excited to be here. I'm, and I'm serious about this. Being at uh, a meeting of the CCSA at the San Diego Convention Center is a direct equivalent of being at a, one of those ale houses in Boston in 1775 where the Friends of Liberty, the Sons of Liberty, and I'm sure the Daughters of Liberty were meeting. You are the insurgency. You are the rebellion. You are, you are the center of what's happening with public education. It's being reformed from the bottom and from the inside. And it's so exciting to be amongst you today, and you recall in that period we had something called a pamphlet called um, Common Sense, written by Tom Paine. I'm a print guy, so I admire print, but that's not the media for today. We have here today Sam Adams, John Adams, the equivalent, and we have Tom Paine, Leslie Chilcott, who, who has produced a movie that is going to have even more impact on the mindset of Americans about education, is having that impact now that Common Sense had on the mindset toward the future of this country um, two and a half to, to 250 years ago. So we're going to examine some hard truths here. We don't have much time, but I want to ask Leslie. I mean, I, was, I saw this movie, and, um, and what struck me was here we have uh, you and your partner, Davis Guggenheim, Davis in particular, somebody raised in a very liberal atmosphere, he went to Sidwell Friends School, 
um, part of the, the community in, in Hollywood, very liberal, a union member himself. He comes into this wide-eyed and innocent. You know, he wasn't involved in all the debates. He wasn't some edgy walk like I am, thinking about this and talking about it for 30 years. Comes into this, follows his own instincts, and comes up with a film that has uh, distinguished itself by examining in clear and sometimes uh, aggressive and negative terms the, um, the state of California, uh, the state of teachers teaching in the United States in a way that never done before. Um, how did we get to that point? How does somebody like that come to the conclusion that the great font of, of great support of liberalism in America, unions, have a real problem? Well, I think it's interesting. Um, I'm in a union. I've been in a union for 11 years. Uh, Davis has been in the same union um, for a little bit longer. So neither one of us came to this. We're big supporters in unions. I believe in unions, and I believe in teachers' unions. Um, however, uh, there's, there's something interesting that happens in this country. When you ask questions about a teachers' union, there is a kind of poisonous, toxic debate that happens. Like, you can't ask any questions about maybe should we look at tenure? Should we look at whether or not teachers are properly being evaluated? Um, should we look at whether great teachers should be rewarded for their great work? You know, all teachers are not the same. You can't even ask these questions. And I think that was very surprising to both of us when we started on the film. But no matter who we talked to, no matter what mainstream district school we went to, no matter what charter school we went to, everyone knows that the single most important factor above all else is a great teacher. And great teachers can't exist in a void, that's true. They need to be supported, they need to be recruited pro properly, they need to have professional training and all of these things, but it's the single most important factor. So when there's no mechanism for singling out the better teachers from the smaller percentage of teachers that aren't great, something is wrong and something there needs to change. So we, we made a deal with each other, Davis and I at the beginning of the film, that we would follow real people, real reformers, and we would show what we found. But in, in the process of thinking through what the movie's going to be, did you say to yourself, we're going to get killed? I mean, we're, we, we just can't do, come up against t unions. We're going to get killed, and our own families will be yelling at us. Well, we, maybe somewhat naively, because we had reached out to both the AFT and the NEA, and because we had interviewed Randy, and because we had tried to get footage of union meetings from the unions themselves, or online, or however we found it, I think we thought that, well, if we embrace them, in some way, they'll embrace us. They'll want to work with this idea. And um, we, what's interesting is we showed the film for the first time at Sundance, which was now January of last year. Film didn't come out until September of last year, and between January and September, a lot of interesting things happened. Now, the film probably played a very small role in that, and probably the people in this room played a much larger role, but the rubber rooms, after years and years and years, were suddenly closed. Suddenly, there was a new contract after three years in Washington, D.C. So even though a lot of people maybe hadn't seen the film, or some had, and we had shown it to both unions, um, we, we became encouraged uh, by the fact that uh, all the union people were willing to talk to us and they seemed to be taking some positive steps as a result. How about being co-opted or, or used by the extreme right wing? I mean, I wrote a book about the KIPP schools and their yeah. two founders are, you know, two, uh, they won't tell me what their politics are, but I'm sure they're liberal Democrats. And they got invited to <laughs> appear at the 2000 Republican National Convention in Philadelphia and they said to go, well, anybody will listen to us, that'd be fine. And their, parent, their families were screaming at them. I mean, co-opted by, by George Bush. Were you afraid that that was going to happen to you, that all the right-wingers would embrace you and you would be, nobody would invite you to dinner anymore that, in West LA? That, that we didn't uh, suspect or expect. I didn't real. I went on Fox News eight times. I didn't know who any of the reporters were, just because <laughs> I just don't watch Fox. Apparently, they were some of the bigger reporters, and they kept asking us back. You know, I did not. I did not expect that. I also didn't expect um, there were certain political uses of the film. Certain people running for office would run ads about the film. Or um, just last week, Rush Limbaugh said, go see Waiting for Superman, which is fine in and of itself. But then his next sentence was uh, something, uh, you know, linking the film to the reason that there shouldn't be unions in Wisconsin or anywhere else. And clearly, 
that is far from what we're saying in the film and far from what our intentions were and what's happening there is a completely different thing in my opinion, but it, it continues to happen. And you can't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. If someone says go see the film and here's why, there's not a lot that so you, you can do about that. So you think if a right-wing person goes to see the film, they might learn something they didn't know and it will, it will help them see the light. I think that I think I think that that's true, and I think that I, I've had a number of teachers come up to us who had gotten letters from their union that told them not to see the film, and they went and saw it anyway, and they expected something that was not there. And they right. said, "I heard that this was the most horrible film. It clearly said that all public teachers are bad." You know, you go to the AFT website, and it says that the movie says that public school teachers are bad. Mm -hmm. now, does that even make any sense? Who, who's supposed to teach? I mean, what? It doesn't even you know. It doesn't even make any sense. So. I'm going to turn to Raf. Raf is here, um, last minute replacement for Howard Fuller, who um, you know, looks 50 but is actually 70 and had a few minor health issues, couldn't come out. But he's, he's in good shape. I'm just, we're, we'll miss him, but Raf is uh, wonderful to come in and feel this. So uh, well, let's, t let's look at clip two, and then we'll talk to Raf again about some hard truths about schools and, and this insurgency that we have here. Raf, um, look at your crystal ball. Obviously, we've got some charter schools in California, the Green Dock schools certainly, and some others that are, uh, have the union representation. Most of them don't. Um, where are we going in this relationship between the charter school movement and the labor unions? What's, what's happening in California? Can California take the rest of the country to a good place, or are we going to have fights for the next generation? That's a good question. And, and certainly, first of all, you, you're not getting Howard, and Howard is phenomenal, as you know. Um, and I, I'm 25 and look 50, so I'm sort of the inverse of, <laughs> of Howard. It's because I've been in this movement a long time. And, um, but you know, to answer your question, I mean, I believe, fundamentally believe that, you know, I'm, not, I'm neither pro or anti-union. I'm just anti-anything that gets in the way of getting teachers to do what's best in the best interest of kids. And that's education code. That's, that's tenure. That's collective bargaining. One way of compensating, evaluating teachers, all of those things. And I think what, what California really has to do is, is get around this issue of we want autonomy and local control of all of our public schools, and we've got to get rid of those things that don't give local control, autonomy, and accountability at the local level. And I mean local. I don't mean school districts that run 600,000-seat schools. I'm talking about communities and neighborhoods and families and parents. Uh, so I think if we can just get along that message around how do we get outcomes for kids, local control, and autonomy, that we can actually have a conversation that can lead us to a reform that I believe is, w will, in fact, take care of teachers' unions, reform them in some way or another. But the conversation has to start in a very, from a different place, not let's get rid of tenure. Well, let's think broadly. Let's, what, what is holding us back from being the greatest public school system in the world? It's yeah. not the kids. You know, in Maryland, where I live, thank you. The charter school law in Maryland, where I live, requires all charter schools to have unionized teachers. I'm wondering, how did we get into California? Why, why, why did, California's supposed to have very powerful unions. They're supposed to run Sacramento. How did we escape that kind of um, law here? Gosh, and I'm, you know, welcome oh, you're to gonna that. Get that. Yeah, because I, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a hard one. It's a hard one. <laughs> I, you know, what I can tell you, Jay, is my schools are not unionized, and yet when I, and I've sat on a lot of these panel, panels with the union members this year, um, and I say to them, this is what our teachers have in our schools. They have control over the school. They, we have shared decision making. They have a phenomenal setup for success. They teach one prep. They have 40 days of professional development. They have, you know, only 100 students they see. They have control over the school. Isn't that what you stand for? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as long as we're getting that, how do, who cares how we get it? The point is that we get it and our kids are succeeding. And so I think we've got to stop thinking about there's only one way to get what we need to get to. And there's, that's the same with charter schools. If we listen to traditional public schools, there's only one way to get there and only one way to reform, and it's not charter. Well, there's charter, and there might be a whole bunch of other ways, and it's not about the process, it's about the outcome. Okay, let's look at our third and last clip um, and then talk a little bit more to Diane. And again, get your questions ready because after a little bit of a chat with Diane, we're going to open it up. People here, this is a very engaged audience. We want to hear what you have to ask or say. So clip three. Uh, 
The California State University system is designed to accept the top one-third of high school graduates, but most are not prepared. They have to remediate 50 to 60 percent of all incoming freshmen before they can take college-level classes. Look at Woodside High School. Out of 100 ninth graders, 62 will graduate, and only 32 will be prepared for a four-year college. But at Summit Prep, out of 100 students, 96 will graduate, and all of them will be ready for a four-year college. To LA. We're going to LA. Remember we're going Emily and her family have signed up for the Summit Lottery. The computer just randomizes the numbers in an order, so say 54A is like the 99th student to get into Summit, then they have a list of all the numbers who aren't going to get in but who are on the waiting list. Was it 300 or 400? 500. For 100 spots? 500. <laughs> well, we'll see. Yeah. Okay, well this is an easy question. What are you doing that Woodside High is not doing? We believe that every single student is capable of college preparation and we actually set them up to, to get there. So we've structured the whole school, it's untracked, it's heterogeneous. All of our kids are in a college prep model with high support and high expectations. And at Woodside High, you walk in and there's the small group that everyone knows is going to college and then there's all the other kids and guess what, most of them have brown faces. So have you seen the movie Race to Nowhere? I have. Okay. So you're doing something that Race to Nowhere says is bad. Mm. You know, you're loading up these poor kids with all these stressful APs and other things. What do you say to people who have that mindset in your neighborhood? I say to them, um, <laughs> the, the um, expected lifetime earning difference between someone who graduates from high school or drops out versus gets a four-year college degree is somewhere between one and two million dollars. Do you have the right to make that choice for that child? Because that's what you're doing. Could, could I add also yeah, please. that, I mean, and they're saying this about black and brown kids. Mm -hmm. right. So the expectation is so low, and it's okay to say that about black and brown kids from neighborhoods where I grew up. It's not okay. It's absolutely not okay. Now, Leslie told us when we were talking before that she was actually looking for a school uh, like Summit that had a real mix of kids. You don't find too many of those these days. No. You know, it's usually all low-income kids or a lot, mostly middle-class kids. So. Is that an explosive mix? How can you yeah. arrange to school the to field together and moving toward the same target if you've got people with so yeah. different backgrounds? You know, most people um, told me that it wasn't possible what we, we were doing. We're, we're right in the middle of Silicon Valley, and we have students who come from the lowest economic levels, from poorest families. Their you know, parents are in prison. It's, it's all of those things that we all deal with. And then I have kids who's dads are a, a CEO of a major Silicon Valley company and everything in between. And people always say, well, those kids would never go to a school with those, those other kids, those other kids. They would never stay there. Why would they do that? They have all the choices in the world. And what we've done is said, you know, there's a lot of people who want to be together, but they want high expectations. They want quality teaching. They want what every child deserves. And if you give that and provide that and you, you have a real focus on community and support, those families want to be there. They don't want to be in a different system. They want to be there. But it's got to be high quality. It's got to be good. It's got to be high expectations for everyone. Um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Diane May one more question, uh, and then we're going to go to the audience. So that we've got mics in the back. Those of you who have questions um, are lined up behind mics. Uh, why don't you get there now so we don't have any awkward silences when we get started. Um, so when you have to go out in your community and explain what Summit does. What are people most confused about in the sort of affluent neighborhoods that you're talking about as to what your school is there and what you're doing? You know what, what people are most confused about is they have no idea, and I know this will be shocking to all of us, that all kids aren't being prepared for college. But you know, that, that clip that you just showed on Woodside, Woodside High School has been saying, and still to this day, says that 98% of their graduates go to college. And the community believes it. They really believe it. And the power of this film is that for the first time ever, they've actually had to come to terms with and say publicly, oh, maybe actually that's not true. So now, what, I mean, they're just take, kids will say, if they're not going to go, they'll say, well, I'm going to CSM or I'm going to Foothill, when they're not actually planning to do that at all, right? 
Is that what happens? Yeah, they, they literally survey the kids and say, what do you think you're going to do next year? They yeah. start, and that's how they present their data. Uh, uh, my charter petitions were denied by the District J because there was no need for a college prep school because their schools were preparing every kid for college. Uh, we've just had a, a, a charter denied in Montgomery County, Maryland, which said exactly the same thing, so I'm going to raise that next time, right? So we have, I see one question you're here. If you could just uh, tell us who you are and hit us with what you want to say. I can hear you. at the kids that are traditionally in the back bungalows, and that's our kids with special needs, and how are our charter schools and other schools treating, um, you know, we, we talk about, you know, the black and the brown kids, but some seriously disenfranchised kids are our kids with special needs. So I'm just gonna encourage you to think about that. If you have a question, you can come to me, <laughs> and I'll be happy to help you. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it, because um, one of the things that I, I usually say when I'm uh, in front of a group or on panels or we're showing the film and we have a Q&A afterwards is that there's so many issues, there was no way for us to put everything in the film, but there are so many issues that you could make entire films on, um, especially special ed. And there's also a lot of myths out there, and you guys live with this every day, that charter schools somehow kick out or reject or only have 1% of special ed students, which is just not true. So there's a lot of uh, education that needs to be done um, and, and PR on on this issue as well. I actually heard someone was making a film on special ed and education. Ref, handle that for a second, because I get that question all the time, particularly about KIPP schools, you know, whether they don't have to take special ed. What's the actual situation with charters in California? By law, we must accept anybody who comes to our doors. Are, right? Is it like, is it though, practically speaking, less likely that they're going to come to a charter school because they've got a, they've worked for years to get up a situation in whatever their local school is and they don't want to lose that in favor of some they don't know. That's, That's exactly right. I mean, if, you, if you're a parent who's advocated for your child for so long and a brand new school opens up down the street, will you take the chance to move them? And many do because out of desperation, kids are getting served. Um, but others are thinking twice about it. And so, and that's great, that's what choice is about, doing what's in the best interest of the child. Um, now, certainly the other uh, end of it is that I do believe that there is some miscommunication in how we handle even incoming information calls around special education. So, a uh, front office person answers the phone, parent on the other side says, do you um, have programs for severely autistic kids? Rather than saying, we accept all students by lottery, come visit us, learn more about our, our school, the answer and truthful answer is no. So already that discourages that person from even finding out more about how a charter school can serve them. So they're just ways that things sometimes, information it gets put out there that could in turn uh, have kids that um, don't, Diane, don't end up coming to school. Given the mission of your school and the attitude you have about raising every, every kid to a new level, do you think you are better equipped to do things for special ed kids than the ordinary school in the neighborhood? One of the things we are most proud of is how the percentage of special ed kids in our school, 15%, and how well we serve them and that we get them all ready for college. And we have spectacular relationships with those families. Um, and you know, it, it's something you don't talk about publicly and it, it, it's unfortunate because um, you know, Emily has a lot of learning differences and that doesn't come through in the film because they've done such a careful treatment um, and been so thoughtful and respectful of her, but she's a perfect example of someone who there was no way she was going to go to college had she gone to the local public school. She was not allowed to be in those classes. She was not on that track. And she will go to college and she will graduate and she will succeed. And it's one of our um, places of innovation and that we're most proud of what we're able to do. Now, I think I see a question you're here, am I right? Yes, go ahead. Good everyone. My name is Linda Moore. I'm director of Watts Learning Center Charter Middle School in front of Nickerson Gardens in Watts, an urban area in Los Angeles. And the special ed question was especially interesting for me because what I see happening, especially at our charter school and other charter schools across the nation, is special ed is, or students with unique needs, is what the charter school does best with. We, I know often we're accused of cherry picking and what have you, but like Riff said, whoever walks up to that door, and I have several parents um, out of a, a, a population of 
uh, sixth and seventh graders that are 120, I'm dealing with at least 20 students that uh, came in with unique needs for various reasons. Um, but when we look at special ed, that's if we truly believe every child has the right to go to college, that includes a, a unique need student. And so when we take a look at those policies and where we're going, in terms of recognizing unique needs students and what their educational process needs to entail. I think it's incumbent upon the charter school movement and the reform movement to really lay out spe uh, specificities about where it's gonna go. Um, we did some very unique things and that's what I love about being a charter school. If they need counseling, you give them counseling. If they, whatever they need, you give them, including the student with unique needs. So when we said, are we accepting, the majority of many of our populations come in with unique needs, specifically uh, having been identified and uh, what, how do they put it in special ed? Eligibility determined. So with that, um, it, just, it just runs a, a thing up my back when I hear about charter schools not servicing students with unique needs. That's who we get. And that's why we've been sponsored in whatever districts we've been sponsored in because we're getting those that were underserved. So with that and the disenfranchising of most special ed populations in the California area, you're dealing with black and brown children. That's, who, that's who's in there for behavioral problems or for whatever reason, but that's who we're getting. Yeah. Thank you, that's very helpful. Now we've got a a lot of people on this side, so let's take a couple from this side. Gentlemen Nathan right there. Rose from the John Adams Academy. And I understand why unions were created 100 years ago to protect rights and to get equal pay and to, for safety you know, in, in the workplace. But given Summit Prep's model and, and many charter schools model, besides collective bargaining, why do unions exist today when federal guidelines protect our safety and our health and our benefits and equal pay? Thank you very much. Uh, and the person right behind you, next question. First, let me say thank you very much for taking some time to um, come to this uh, conference. Um, my name is Mrs. Washington. I'm the principal of Lifeline Charter in Compton, California. And my question is more so about the film. Um, it was interesting that the students that you were able to follow in the film, there are very, very few families from the kids in which I service go to homes where the mother is saying, let me see your homework. Uh, let me take a look at your folder. They don't go to homes like that. They go to homes that have six and seven adults in them um, and maybe four children. Um, there's no dinner on the table. There's no milk and orange juice in the morning. So it was interesting why you did not show um, some of the true reflections of urban families in your film. Did you, did sure. you tell, talk, talk about that? Well, we actually started out following um, a lot more families than you could see in the film, but it, it, couldn't, it couldn't unfortunately be four hours long or none of you would have <laughs> gone to see it. But um, we, we, get this, we get this question a lot. Oh, and and the, the other question that we get that goes along with this is, oh, you found parents that cared, as if most parents don't care. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, we, we found our families by going to info sessions. We went to an info session at Summit, you know, months before the lottery, and we sat there to a packed room and we recruited families. We did the same thing at Harlem Success Academy, we went to Harlem Children's Zone, we went to SEED, we went to KIPP, we went to all these other schools. And we did not find one parent that did not want a better school for their kid. We found parents that couldn't fill out applications, but somehow they knew if the one thing that they could do for their kid was to get them into this better school, that they knew they had to do that. Now that said, Jeffrey Canada will tell you that even when he personally goes to homes or sends his teachers or sends you know, cell phone phone numbers of the teachers home on magnets, there's 30% of the parents there, no matter what, he cannot get them to participate. And with the structure that they have, and the structure that many of you have in your charter schools, with great teachers that are held accountable with the longer school day, and more control over what the kids are doing in the afternoon, they have found out that it doesn't matter. Of course it's better when the parents are involved, but it can no longer be used as an excuse for not educating every child. 
Yeah, and, and people in this room know. Who, I think all of you have spent time in regular schools, and we know that there are plenty of parents inside regular schools who care a lot about their kids. They found a teacher, they found a situation that works for them. They're not going to go to a charter school for very good reasons, caring reasons. So, you know, that's just a myth. A question right here. My name is Heather McManus. I'm the principal of the Camino Nuevo Charter Academy Harvard site in Los Angeles. And my question is about leadership. Because I think, and it goes a little bit along with the union question, like why do we still have unions? And when we look at schools that have unionized, particularly charter schools, it often goes back to the school site leadership. And I'm wondering what you feel um, what role you feel leadership has in ensuring that every child in California has a, a successful teacher in the classroom and a teacher who believes that all kids can learn. Because ultimately, you know, we can talk right. about the issues with teachers, but the principal of the school is the one who needs to get rid of the teachers who are not performing, unionized or not. You have that to ref. Yep, it's, it's a really good point, Heather. I mean, it's, it's really important. Uh, and let's be real. I mean, we have a, probably a handful of really good principal preparation programs in this country, um, let alone the state, right? And so when we get, when we need, we need to get really serious about how we prepare our leaders, how we're supporting them, how we're ensuring that they, in turn, are building cultures that have powerful teaching and learning at the center of the work, which then means that they, along with the teachers, are protecting the profession of teaching, not the individuals. Um, it's, a, it's really, really important. But again, getting to my previous point about what, we act, what are the barriers, right? Well, credentialing programs are barriers. The Commission for Teacher Credentialing is a barrier. The legislative um, decrees around that are barriers. And we've got to push through outcomes, leadership preparation, and huge investments in leadership preparation not to mention my whole big thing right now, which is getting leadership that reflects the community and the kids that are being served. Let's get the next question from this side. Hi, I'm Gail Nadler. I'm the program director at the Multicultural Learning Center. And um, the, the message that resonated for me from the film was something that I think everyone in this room knows really well, is that this, the success of, of a school to, is accelerated when you have a school that is individually run and meets the unique needs of the community that it serves. And I think that's something that we all know very well and I'm wondering if that message, how that message uh, resonated with, or if, if, Leslie, if you got any feedback from legislators or decision makers on what seems to me the solution to this national problem and the existence of all these dropout factories that you know, building schools that are individually run, um, individually operated, and meet the unique needs of the community they serve. We've, um, we've after the film had its initial theatrical release, um, we started doing a, a different, uh, couple different tracks or series of screenings. One was we've done over 20 town halls um, nationwide. We just had one in DC that was actually in Anthony's neighborhood in Anacostia, and we had a panel there. And um, even on a rainy night, 200 parents and people showed up because no one had ever held a panel in the Anacostia neighborhood on education before. So I, I mention that because um, in addition to that, we've had 20 state capital screenings and screenings um, specifically for the legislature. And then we hold a, a, a panel afterwards and we discuss the film. And I think that although it's currently different here in California, there are a lot of uh, Congress people on both sides of the political spectrum that are saying, hey, maybe we should raise the limits on charters. Maybe we shouldn't have them. Maybe, maybe we don't need to be so strict about this. And I've been at meetings where this has been discussed. So I'm, I'm not sure it's happening you know, rapidly or fast enough at a national level, but I know it is happening in some communities. This question right here. Hi, my name is Eileen Logue. I work with several charter schools here in San Diego and have since 1994. I, my comment is more to a comment made about we have such powerful unions in the state of California, teachers unions, prison guards unions. Don't start me on how many prisons are being fed by failing schools. Um, but my comment is 
how is it that unionism wasn't imposed on charter schools because of advocacy? If you remember several years ago, there was legislation that was pending that would have imposed collective bargaining on all charter schools. And because of CCSA and the advocacy that happened, we were able to thwart that and it was, um, the, the compromise was AB 486, where every charter school had to declare whether for the purposes of collective bargaining, they were the employer of record or their school district. People marched up to Sacramento. I was one, that's the only time I've gone to Sacramento and I was so passionate, I went door to door and I went to these different Democrat offices and I said, you call yourself the party of choice? Yet you want to impose this on charter schools? If a charter school wants to unionize, let them. There's nothing stopping them, but don't impose it. So the advocacy is so important, and thank you to CCSA. Thank you to you who made these movies and bring awareness. Could you tell us your name again? Eileen Logue. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember that. Thank you for answering my question. <laughs> So glad I am to be moving from Maryland back to California this year. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go with the next question right there. Hi, I'm, I'm kind of vertically challenged on the Me too. microphone here. Uh, <laughs> my name is Celina Cunningham, and I am a parent and also the president of the board at our school, the Learning Choice Academy, right here in San Diego. And I was wondering, because I've long held this theory that traditional education triages children, uh, they have the top level who they feel like it will, those children will go on to college no matter what the school does. They have the mid-level where maybe those kids will go to college if they're helped, and then they have the bottom level which they consider the throwaway children because in their minds those kids will never go to college. And I have seen that throughout traditional education even as young as elementary school. And I was wondering, when you were making the film, did you have a sense of that with the traditional education? We, we had a sense of it because it, it was, it, so many people are not aware that they are tracked at all. Um, this is something that, you know, you, you talk to your average parent in your average public school and they haven't really even heard of tracking. And the fact that it's like this dirty little secret that a lot of people don't know about. And the fact that you know somewhere along the line in third or fourth grade, you kind of go like this or you go like this and they get farther and farther apart. We found that, that really shocking. So we had a, a, a bit of a sense and then we kept meeting people that specifically wanted to go to charter schools because there was no tracking. So that was really a, a profound thing that we learned along the way. Now we're, we're over time, but I'm going to take the progress of going two more questions beyond time. So we have someone right here. Uh, you mentioned that you'd taken this film, this is Eldon Rose now, Great Valley Academy, uh, to state legislatures. Did you take it to the states that don't have any charter laws? There are 14 of them, I believe. I, I would have to check because I wasn't cross-referencing for that, but I think we have. Did, any reaction from those states that don't even have charters? Let's see, where we went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't actually have a, a good answer for that. But, but what I can tell you is that when we do our screenings where a lot of parents come, and, and you guys probably see this all the time, parents don't care if their kids are going to a charter school, a district school, a magnet school, a parochial school. All they care about is that they have great teachers and that their kids get a great education. So I would encourage those of you um, in the charter school movement to use your, use your data more. And I, I mean, I don't mean that to sound condescending. Use your metrics. Get out the statistics that you have 15% special ed kids in your school. Get an amazing reporter to write a story about how these are the actual numbers in your area. Forget the Stanford Credo study, forget this other study. I mean, that's a very good study. But there's a lot of misinformation because there's a small number of charters at the bottom that are doing really poorly, but there is a great number at the top that are knocking it out of the park like Summit and a lot of these other schools. So I would encourage you to, in a, in a non-emotional way, get that data out there 
And then the woman that was up here a little while ago that had the story of this one kid that they have helped so much, do a personal story on that kid because there is, there's so many entrenched interests that are preventing the real numbers from getting out there. So I'm going to take this person at this mic and then this person here and that will be it. So My right name here. is Elaine Taylor and I'm a parent at Nubia Leadership Academy. And I want to know when you're, you know, I hear these drop words about these throwaway kids and black, you know, brown, black children, they're children. And as a parent, you know, when I hear that word, I have to wonder, are you really concerned about children just across the board? You know, there, there are a lot of parents out there that want, the, want, want teachers to relate to us and what's going on with our children and where they are as far as we are as parents. There are a lot of parents out there, they don't have any jobs. You're sending home things. No one's relating to us. Speak to us. Try and find out what's going on with us, because us together, we can help our children. Speak to us. It's a great point. Make time to speak to us. It's a good point. But, um... I also want to make sure that we, um... The reason why we, we use that, the reason I use and make sure people understand that minority kids, pe kids of color, poor kids are in charters is for a long time we've been accused of being a, um, you know, soccer moms movement, uh, white middle class uh, moms who started charter schools in the um, North, North their California. And so we've got to just be clear about the message that we're sending and where we're using that message. But you're absolutely right. It's about um, speaking to each individual speaking to us. I love that. I'm going to get a t-shirt that says that. Speak our our last question is right here. Yeah. Hi, my name's Heidi Shin. I'm the principal of a school, Saba College Prep in Watsonville, California. Um, my question is, um, I, I'm originally from Providence, Rhode Island, and as you know, there's this huge uproar in Providence where um, all the teachers in the school district have been fired um, and are waiting to find out whether they get their jobs when they come back. And knowing it kind of coincides with the um, release of Waiting for Superman, and whether it's intended or not, it is a consequence in some ways of that. Um, I'm wondering if you have, and it's disheartening in a lot of ways as well, if you know of any other things that aren't coming out in the news that where there are intended consequences from the movie um, that are actually showing that unions are actually changing what they're doing in handling ineffective teachers. Um, I think there are, there are a number of really good examples. As I mentioned before, since we finished the film, there's a brand new, um, or it's not brand new now, it's almost a year old teaching contract in Washington, D.C., where a certain percentage of um, the evaluation, well, basically teachers are being evaluated now. Um, in the state of Colorado, uh, there, the Colorado, I think, is anyone here from Colorado? Oh, you were? Okay. Well, Col Colorado, I think, should be watched very closely right now because between the state senator, Mike Johnston, and uh, Michael Bennett, who's a senator from Colorado, within the last two years, they have so much innovation going on there, and their teacher's contract is particularly interesting because 50% of the teacher's evaluation is based on value added, meaning the student is tested at the beginning and the end of the year, so the student is measured against him or herself, and it's a fair way to evaluate what's added throughout the year. And, and all of, you know, Mike Johnston, Mike Bennett, all of these people have seen the film. I know that there's some other new contracts in the works in various places in the East Coast, and you, you may be able to answer mm -hmm. this, actually. I think there's a lot of reform in in, um, that is actually coming from the teachers' unions. Of course, it's not moving at the pace that we would, we would like. But, you know, I want to say one more thing. I will tell you why I think teachers' unions are important. Um, I don't think that every school needs to have a unionized teaching staff, but you guys are the reformers. You do have control over what principal you hire, what teachers you have. But 90% of our kids are going to public schools right now. I hope that number changes, but that's the reality. And the teachers unions aren't just going to disappear. So if they can use some of the evaluation models that schools like Summit have in place for their teachers and use those as a template, or if people can use the template that's in Colorado right now, 
then I think we will propel things years forward. But, but, but saying, I understand that some people say we don't need teachers unions anymore, but a lot of these teachers and these other schools are not in the great situations that you are. They haven't had the tools to make these wonderful, innovative situations, and they do need their union. Um, what's also interesting, as I travel the country, most of the great teachers that I talk to are not active in their union. And that's interesting. They want their union in case they're accused of something or there's some impropriety or, or something happens. I mean, there are some things that happen, especially in inner city schools where teachers are accused of things that they did not do and they need that protection. I hope you will uh, join me in thanking Leslie and Ref and, and Diane for this great session. <laughs>